If you've been following my videos on trying to write melodies in harmony with ChatGPT, I'm sure you've been wondering, what about rhythm? Can ChatGPT create a funky fresh groove? Now, I'm not exactly an experienced beat maker in any remotely traditional sense. But what I do have is an Ableton Live free trial and a Python library I created called Scamp, which I can use to route ChatGPT's responses to Ableton. The first thing I tried to do was settle on a format for the beat. I started with a similar approach to my previous videos, asking it to format each layer of the beat as a list of note durations. Then I told it to put everything into a Python dictionary with one layer for kick, one for snare, and one for hi-hat. To keep it simple, I started with a beat in 4-4. Here's ChatGPT's first attempt. To hear what this sounds like, I've set up Ableton with a standard rock kit, and I've created a Python script using Scamp so that when I paste ChatGPT's response right here and click Run, it sends MIDI messages to Ableton and plays the beat. Okay, sounds pretty standard, pretty boring. But let's take a closer look at what ChatGPT notated. It says that the snare is playing on beats 2 and 4, the backbeat, which would make sense. But actually the note durations of 2 and 2 would place it on beats 1 and 3, which maybe you don't really notice at first in the playback since the kick drum is playing on every beat. I can't really criticize this though, because I didn't give ChatGPT a way to write a rest. So my next step was to tell it to use negative numbers to represent a rest, reiterate that the snare should play on beats 2 and 4, and tell it to have the kick and hi-hat incorporate a little resting too. Here's what it came up with. As you can see, there are some rests in the kick and hi-hat, but the snare is still solidly on beats 1 and 3, not on 2 and 4 as it purports to be. Also, the astute among you may have noticed that the loop does not last 4 beats. This is because the hi-hat part is 5 beats long. Oops. Clearly, we need a slightly different approach. By the way, if you're intrigued by this combination of Python and music, consider taking my course on cadenze.com. It's a totally beginner-friendly way of learning Python while making music in the process. Anyway, back to our beat making, I started to suspect that the issue had to do with counting from zero versus counting from one, one of the banes of my experience as a musician coder. See, in a measure of 4-4, here's how musicians talk about the beats. But if we measure how much time has passed since the start of the measure, zero beats have passed at beat 1, one has passed at beat 2, and so on. There's a similar issue, by the way, with pitch. Our names for musical intervals are unison, second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. Despite the fact that a second is one scale step wide, a third is two steps wide, a fourth is three steps wide, and so on. This confusion of nomenclature is no doubt confusing to a language model that is trying to interpolate between training data in which people are discussing music and training data consisting of numbers and code. Code tends to be a count from zero kind of environment, whereas musicians tend to count from one. So to try to bridge the gap, I changed the format I was asking for. Instead of a list of note durations, I asked for a list of moments at which the notes were supposed to play. So suppose we have a grid of four beats and we want to notate this rhythm. The old notation was to just list the durations of the notes. The new notation is to list the start times of the notes. And notice, I made the beginning of the bar beat 1, not beat 0, so that anything GPT-4 had learned about the snare playing on beats 2 and 4 would apply directly. Here's what it came up with. Notice that now, because of the change of format, the snare truly does play on beats 2 and 4, as it claims to in the comments. I also thought I would make things a little bit more nuanced by including the volume as well as the timing of each hit. Pasting the result into a new version of the Python script, the result is a very simple beat. A little like My Sharona, actually. And now that we have a reliable format, we can explore just how much expressive potential GPT Beats has. When I compose music, especially algorithmic music, I often like to think about it parametrically. For example, this script has two main parameters, melodic smoothness and rhythmic smoothness, which I'm controlling with the mouse position. When melodic smoothness is high, it tends to move in scales, and when it's low, it skips up and down. Similarly, when rhythmic smoothness is high, the notes are all the same length, whereas when it's low, they stutter. So I thought a nice way to explore ChatGPT's rhythmic potential would be to specify a few different parameters to play with. Specifically, complexity, intensity, smoothness, and funkiness, along with time signature. 
After ChatGPT responded to this idea with pretty reasonable definitions of these terms, I went ahead and asked it for a beat in 4.4 with high complexity, but low intensity, smoothness, and funkiness. Here's what the result sounded like. Not bad, but it definitely misses when it comes to complexity and smoothness. It says it'll have abrupt changes in rhythm and volume, but it clearly doesn't. To be fair though, the parameters I've given it are a bit entangled with one another, so it may be getting mixed messages. Rather than fix this glaring issue, I decided to explore the space of possibilities a bit more, giving it various random combinations of the specified parameters. I also tried the beats with different drum kits. Take a listen. Now I noticed that this last beat, despite supposedly having extremely high complexity and intensity, never divided a beat into smaller than half, so I pointed out that it could use smaller subdivisions and tuplets to see if that made a difference. It did. Okay, so having done all of this, I felt it was time to put something a little more substantial together. This time, I asked ChatGPT to create a 4-bar loop, consisting of 3 bars of 4-4 and 1 bar of 3-4. I wanted it to be complex, intense, and funky. Overall, the beat should be cohesive, and the final bar should lead back into the first. It responded with its characteristic excitement, but the beat it gave me was broken. It used list comprehensions in the hi-hat part in a way that made no sense and broke the script, and it also overran the 15-beat total duration of the assignment. Pointing out these errors, I asked it to try again, and this time it succeeded. Let's take a listen using Ableton's Quark Kit. I was actually pretty impressed with this. It managed to do exactly what I said, creating a beat which was different from measure to measure, but overall cohesive. So far, so good. So I asked it to go a step further and add some J Dilla inspired micro timing variation, pushing and pulling some of the parts ahead or behind the beat. I was inspired to do this, by the way, by the book Dilla Time, which I highly recommend. Anyway, you may notice that I tried this prompt six different times. The reason is that, even when I explicitly say that other than these adjustments it should keep everything exactly the same, it responded with incomplete beats, like this one that's missing all but the first bar of the kick part. I just couldn't get it to only do the micro timing. Still, it was kind of interesting, let's take a listen anyway. For the final icing on the cake, I decided to add a synth part, using the same kind of techniques as in my previous videos. This also took quite a few tries. Although it helpfully included a line of code to check that the part was 15 beats long, it still kept giving me beats that failed that check. Still, after a long process of back and forth, we were finally able to put something together that kind of worked. Are you ready for it? The GPT Beats final project? Well, here you go. So what can we learn from ChatGPT's efforts in beat making? Well, for one thing, the musical encoding matters. When we use an encoding that allows ChatGPT to leverage its training data better, for instance by numbering the downbeat 1 instead of 0, it performs better. In fact, I tried a number of other encodings as well. In one of them I asked it to imagine that it's programming a step sequencer, and that had pretty good results. In another, I asked it to produce strings of letters with K for kick, H for hi-hat, S for snare, and underscore for the passage of time. In this case, it struggled quite a bit more, although it did do certain things like introducing swing for the jazz rhythm. Anyway, I'm tempted to say that this is a real difference between large language models and human beings. 
Sure, a human being might get mixed up a little when converting between formats that count from beat 0 versus from beat 1, but I think we're more aware of the ideal logical relationship that exists between the same beat expressed in different formats. What do you think, though? Are human skills as context and prompt dependent as those of large language models? The other thing I was struck by in this process is that ChatGPT is unable to differentiate between a strong suggestion and a firm rule. For example, when I asked it to add Dilla-style microtiming, it couldn't help but alter the beat in other ways, despite my clear instructions not to. Likewise, every time I suggested a way that it might change the synth melody, it messed up the number of beats in the melody in the process. This is an issue because musical problems often feature this kind of mixture between firm constraints and softer, fuzzier constraints. For example, the range of the violin has a firm limit of G3 on the lower end, but a fuzzier, more ambiguous upper limit, as extreme notes become harder and harder to play cleanly and with agility. Likewise, asking for a beat that's funky is a kind of fuzzy constraint, whereas asking it to produce something that's 7 beats long or has exactly 12 notes in it is a hard, clear-cut constraint. For a language model like GPT-4, everything is just part of the prompt. Even hard, firm constraints are treated merely as strong suggestions. The language model just provides an intuitive response without any error checking or validation. In the book Thinking Fast and Slow, Daniel Kahneman divides human cognition roughly into two systems, an effortless, intuitive pattern-matching process which he calls System 1, and an effortful, logical, deliberative system, which he calls System 2, whose role is to curate and validate the suggestions of System 1. One of the examples he uses to illustrate this is the following question. If five machines can produce five widgets in five hours, how many hours will it take a hundred machines to produce a hundred widgets? For many people, the intuitive answer that immediately pops into our head is a hundred hours. That answer comes effortlessly and immediately from our pattern matching System 1. But it's wrong. If you apply conscious critical effort to the problem for a moment, which Kahneman calls System 2, you'll realize that each machine takes 5 minutes to make a widget, so 100 machines will make 100 widgets in 5 minutes. The truth, I think, is that large language models are pure System 1. Even when they seem logical, they're still just pattern matching based on mountains of logical training data. And perhaps because the things I'm doing in this video are further outside of that training data, you can see the cracks in its logical thinking. For language models to reach a truly sophisticated level of musical thinking, they'll need to be coupled with something akin to System 2, a guiding hand that can detect when there's something wrong with the automatic, intuitive answers that they generate. But what do you think? What did ChatGPT get right about writing beats? And what did it get wrong? And what could I have done better in prompting it? Do you agree with this comparison to Kahneman's System 1 and System 2? And if so, what would creating and incorporating a System 2 entail? One way of incorporating System 2, by the way, is to have the language model and human prompter work together as a team. Of course, in a way this is what I've already been doing in these videos, but if you want to see it taken a step further, you should check out this video in which I truly collaborated with ChatGPT to write a piece for solo violin. Oh, and check out my Patreon. I'm posting all of the scripts and prompts for these ChatGPT videos there.